Okay, all right. Hi, I'm Todd Leonhardt. Uh, I'm here with Kevin Van Brunt. We're both doing this talk. Uh, we're both core maintainers of CMD2, which is an open source application for making interactive command line applications. We're going to go into lots of detail of what that means and what it doesn't mean. Um, first of all, we are available on GitHub. So if you just like click the link in this presentation, then go to GitHub page, you can go, you can click on the documentation, it's up on Read the Docs. We're ve very welcoming to contributors, um, love to have more people. We've got very good CI where we build for Windows, Mac, and Linux for all supported versions of Python. We've got greater than 97% code coverage. Uh, we've got a Discord to chat in. Uh, there's been lots of contributors over the years. Uh, we've had 28 total contributors. It's been around since oh, 2008 or 9. Uh, the original author is Catherine Devlin, which if anyone went to the talk this morning uh, about you know, being new to Python, she gave that. Um, but the core maintainers over the years have been Kevin, myself, Catherine, uh, Jared Crapo, Eric Lynn, and Federico Serrato. Everyone's done a lot of good work. And close that. Okay, um, we have slides and examples up on GitHub. You can click this link. Uh, this will be available later for you to download all the example code. So CMD2 is a Python module for building interactive command line applications. We're talking about interpreters, things that are called a shell or a REPL or a console, where you go into it and you stay there, you do a bunch of things, then you finally exit. It's not the same as a command line utility where you run once and you're done. So think things like Bash or SQLite 3 or IPython. It's an interactive environment. It extends Python's built-in CMD module, which is a very bare bones module in the standard library, and we add a ton of features on top of it. As I said, it's open source on GitHub. It's available under an MIT license, so it's very permissive for pretty much anything. Uh, so what it's not for, used for, just to be clear, uh, it's not intended to build command line utilities, something where you run it and it's done. Uh, things like Git or LS or grep. It's meant for interactive in shells. Uh, if you want to build a command line utility, either Python's built-in arg parse module or third-party click are excellent options for doing that. It's also not meant for building a full screen text user interface, something like Vim or Top. Uh, there's other like things like the curses module for doing that. Um, so why in this day and age would you want to build a CLI? A lot of people might be asking that question. Why don't I build a GUI or a web app? So CLI, first of all, it's very quick and easy and cheap to build compared to a full featured GUI. Secondly, it's intrinsically scriptable, suitable for automation by external tools and calling other tools itself. Um, and a CLI, an interactive command line application, has several advantages in terms of user friendliness, built-in help, tab completion, I don't know about you, but my end users never read the freaking manual. So the more self-contained you can make that help system, the more it's useful. And CLIs are very popular in the DevOps and automation community as well as the security community. Why build it in Python? I'm not going to go into much detail. I'm pretty sure most of you are converted to this. But it's very productive and it's also really easy to integrate with C and C++ code. And there's a ton of wonderful libraries in Python. Uh, why use CMD2? Well, I have customers that ask for a lot of features like we want your application to be scriptable in Python. We want good tab completion. We want good built-in help. We want full Unicode support. We want history of commands. We want to be able to pipe your output to a shell command, run shell commands, redirect. We support all of that out of the box for free and we provide a lot more features. Now an alternative to CMD2 might be something like Python Prompt Toolkit different advantages and disadvantages, but that's kind of the, mar the same market we're in there. This is a busy slide, not going to details. Just wanted to point out that there's certain basic features which are inherited from CMD that CMD2 then expands upon, and then there's a ton of advanced features that we're gonna go into detail on some of them, but it's not, we can't cover everything in 45 minutes. Um, so for creating a CMD2 application, what you do is you import CMD, then you create an instance of the cmd2.cmd class, and you add whatever else you want to it, but that right there, that's your basic core of the application, 
you instantiate an instance of that class and you run the command loop method to enter your REPL. So some code of what that looks like, and I'm actually gonna hop over to an IDE because I think it looks better. Oops, where are we at? Okay, so here is a basic application where we, I'm gonna go past the help. We import CMD2. We're gonna import this extra style function for just doing some colorized output. We have our basic app class, which inherits from cmd2.cmd. We have our init method, which calls the super init with some various options. You don't need to call it with any options, but you can tweak various things. You can set a few extra attributes. And down at the bottom, in our little main part, we instantiate an instance of our basic app class, and we call app.commandLoop. That's it, that's all you need to do. It's a few lines of code. You get a full featured application and we'll show you in a second what you get from that. Um, so obviously you're gonna wanna add commands. It's not very useful if you don't add your own custom commands. How do you do that? So this, is in, this part of it's inherited from CMD. You simply implement a method in your cmd2.cmd class that begins with do underscore. And then if you have a do underscore foo, you're gonna create a command called foo. It's that simple. And then you can do whatever you want. And then help for that command is automatically by default provided whatever your doc string is, is the built-in help for that command. So going to the code for that, looking, we implemented here two very simple commands. We're not trying to show anything complicated, we're trying to show the basics of the API. So we implemented an intro command where up here we defined an intro banner. This can be whatever you want, it's just a banner that's displayed once when you enter the application. We used our style function built into CMD2, which we kind of stole from Click. They had a lot of good uh, ways of doing things. Uh, where you can colorize it, implement a foreground, background color, make it bold, make it underlined, that sort of thing. And then we set a few other options, but then here we just reprint the intro banner, and then we made one to just echo whatever you put out to the command just to show you how you create a command. Now, if I go to a terminal and run this application, oops, typing in the wrong place. All right, so there we are. What we did, we started up, we printed our intro banner. Turns out if you looked at those options, we specified a startup script in that startup script, you can, a user can customize their experience to run whatever commands they want to at the beginning. One of the things you can do that we're gonna get into later is you can create your own aliases and macros. Uh, so those get ran, and then there we are at our command line. So one of the first things you might wanna do is how do I get help? Well, you start typing help, you hit tab, completes all the commands, and it's gonna show you the commands. One thing you can do is you can categorize commands, and in that application, we made all of the built-in ones have a certain name, and our custom ones have another category. You can also do help.v to get verbose help, where you get a little just brief description, which is just the first line of your doc string to show you what that command does. Then on any given command, if I hit help and I start typing intro, notice we're tab completing not only command, commands, but for this command for help, we're completing the names. And it just says display intro banner. It's that simple. Um, if we want to run our command, we run intro. There we go, reprints the intro banner. Echo, we can just, you know, foo, bar, boz, whatever. And that's a multi-line command. Uh, if you specify it's in the init, you can say, oh, these commands are multi-line commands where you accept multiple lines of input. Um, so that's really, the basics of how you create an application. And I'm gonna hop back over here for a second. Uh, how do I add help? Again, just the doc string. Whatever you use for the doc string for that do underscore method is your default help. If you want something more complicated, you can implement a help underscore foo, where foo is your command name, and then you can give some kind of rich dynamic help. And later on, we've got a bunch of arg parse decorators where we can automatically extract help from those, which uh, Kevin will get into showing you those in a bit. For tab completion, uh, you can implement a complete underscore foo method, which is a read line completer function. We have a bunch of common built-in ones. You're probably not gonna wanna do it yourself, you just use one of ours. 
you could do it yourself from scratch. And we also have a better, higher level way of doing that if you're using the arg parse decorators. But all of the same built-in commands use good, sane tab completion wherever we can. Uh, history is something people want in their command line applications. We have two different uh, forms of built-in history that work together. We support full read line history where it has a memory of what you've typed, where you can use up arrows or control R, and that's simply, you know, if I just up arrow, I'm going to get through everything I've typed. Or if I wanted to do a reverse search, I hit control R and I would say I want to see what if I type with intro. You know, boom. I rerun the command. Uh, we also have a history command, which shows the history for your session. Now, if we want to get help on history, we can do that. It might go off my screen, so I'm going to pipe it to less. Getting ahead of myself. Um, so that's just showing, and this is one of the commands using argparse, showing all the possible flags of what you can do with our history command. It's got a very rich syntax. You can use Python slicing to extract certain history items. We actually use one base indexing for this, not zero based. You can do a regular expression search, text search. By default, it just prints out the history. You can also specify a persistent history file in the initialization and then it will preserve history bef between runs of your application. It can be very useful if you're going, how did I run that again? Uh, history command can also be used to run previous commands from history, edit previous commands from history, and then run them in your editor of choice, output commands to a file to run as a script, and we have a built-in regression testing framework for testers that can automatically run commands and generate the file, your regression testing file. Lots to digest. We're just trying to get the basics here. So very powerful history, lots of options. We have a built-in edit command, so we have a built-in editor. Actually, we don't have a built-in editor. We go find a sane one on your system and use that. So on my system, if I wanted to edit, say, this file that I'm in, I'm in basic.py. Notice that it tab completed files. I jump into it. It found vim on my system, and it used that by default. If you're an Emacs fan, we have settable parameters. You can set your editor of choice. It can even be a GUI. Uh, yeah, about the settable environment parameters. We have a bunch of built-in ones, and it's really easy to add your own. Fundamentally, it's a dictionary saying, I have this, here's a description. Uh, if you want to look at those settable parameters for what's built in, uh, I can just type set, and I can hit tab tab. And here's one form of interesting tab completion we have that allows you to say, hey, when I tab complete, don't just tab complete my thing, but give me some more information about it. Like maybe you're tab completing something from a database and your primary key is an integer. It doesn't really tell you a lot, but you could give more context to the person and saying, hey, here are my parameters that I allow for set, and here's a description of what it is. So one example is allow ANSI. This affects whether ANSI escape codes are allowed or whether we strip them out. So when we printed that intro banner in color, by default, we're going to strip that out if you redirect output and you're not in a terminal if you're redirecting it to a file. But you can choose to never display that or always display that. So if I set allow ANSI to never and I rerun intro, it's not in color anymore. And then I can set it back, allow ANSI. Note, I'm tab completing the parameters. I'm going to set that to terminal, where it was, and boom, there I am. So we've got a bunch of built-in ones, things that where you can like time your commands, enter a debug mode, change lots of things. You can easy to add your own for dynamic parameters that are settable at runtime in that environment. Okay, shell commands. You can run any arbitrary shell command. Of course, you have to have that command on your system. We can't magically run something which isn't there. Um, and we have good tab completion of both the command names and file system paths afterwards. So here, let's suppose I'm on a Mac, I can look for ls, uh, and to run a shell command, you either run the shell command, or we have a shortcut where it's an exclamation point, and then the shell command you're trying to run. I can run that, or I could also say tab complete my directory, run what's in there. So arbitrary shell commands works the same, goes out to your path and finds all executable files and then tab completes those. So if I were to just do like CA and hit tab tab, it's gonna show me every executable thing that begins with CA. Okay, 
Output redirection or piping, wonderful feature of Unix and POSIX cells. We can take your command output from any CMD2 command and allow you to redirect it to files or pipe to shell commands. And you can actually have multiple redirect, you know, multiple levels of piping to your heart's content. You just can't pipe to another CMD2 command. It has to be a shell command. Uh, it's standard syntax. You use one greater than to overwrite a file, two greater thans to append to a file, or a pipe symbol to pipe. Um, and in this case, we have one extra little feature where if you don't specify a file after the redirection, we'll send it to the clipboard. Uh, paste buffer, whatever you call it in your OS, then you can paste it into something else. Um, there's a few limitations that apply, but not many. And this is a really killer feature where your end users can use your application and do things you didn't think of because they have extra shell commands available. It's the whole Unix philosophy there. Um, so here, let's say I was going to simply, uh, yeah, run my ls-hal and I'm gonna pipe it to less. Boom, there I am. Or I wanna send it to a file. Like I'm gonna run my intro command and I'm gonna send that to intro.txt. And now I can cat intro.txt. And notice in this case, it stripped the color code because we were redirecting to a file. So that ability to redirect and pipe is extremely useful. You're taking arbitrary command output and sending that somewhere else. Lots of wonderful text processing you can do with that. We have the ability to run commands and invocation, which is if someone types something after your basic CMD2 application on the command line, we assume they are trying to run commands and arguments, and we will treat that as such. Now, if you're running more than one command, you should quote things so it can reasonably pick up where the arguments for one command end and where the next one starts. Uh, so this allows you to do interesting things like even quit the application so then you can use a CMD2 application like a command line utility where it runs something and is done. What kind of quoting is it? It's not too It's So single quotes, double quotes, it's pretty flexible. Okay. Yeah. Um, so here, if I quit my application, I just run basic.py, and I say I want to run intro, then it's going to run intro when it comes up, and it enters the shell. But if I had done, say, I want to run a pwd shell command and then quit, boom, does its thing. So it gives you the ability, and it runs, if you have a startup script, it runs all of that first and then runs your commands and invocation. Uh, we support text file scripts in ASCII or UTF-8 encoded formats, uh, and these are very simple. It's exactly what you would type on the command line, command plus arguments, one per line, boom, boom, boom. And it will then run them in sequence. You use the run script command or the at symbol, and comments are allowed uh, in Python style. If you start the line with a hash, then that line is treated as a comment, and we don't try to run it. There's also a relative run script, which is really only intended to be used inside other scripts, and then that will take the pathing relative to the first script. Uh, so for this, if I look in, I enter my application, uh, and I look in what is in my scripts directory, I see there is a uh, script.txt. So I'm going to, if I look at what's in script.txt, I see that it's going to run intro and then it's going to echo some stuff. So I run script, script.txt. Notice it's tab completing paths and everything along the way. I run my two commands and it's back in the shell. And I'm going to turn it over to Kevin for a while. Thank you. So a lot of the features that he's been showing, these are all built in, built into CMD2. You get them for free. Uh, one other feature that you get for free is, is aliasing a, a command, sort of like you would have in Bash. Um, this, since we're using um, argparse and with subcommands, alias is a command that has subcommands. You can do alias create, list, um, figure what else I'll show you in a moment. But basically the syntax is this. You do alias create. I'm going to create an alias called LH. And what it's going to run is the, the bang, so the shell command of ls dash H-A-L. So when you actually run that, um, on that second line there, 
it's going to do an LS, uh, a bang LS HAL on home user. Um, since redirection characters are special characters to our parser, if you wanted that to actually be part of your alias value, the thing that actually gets passed to the shell, just quote it when you, um, when you actually create the alias and we'll strip off the quotes for you and that'll actually be part of your alias value. Um, what's kind of neat about this is, my Mac ignorance, how do I get back to your? Four fingers. Four fingers, that's that right. Way. Okay, so what's kind of neat about this is uh, tab completion, when you start tabbing an alias, behind the scenes is actually resolving the alias for you. So it'd be tab completing as if you had actually typed the alias's value on the line. So right now what we have, if I do an alias list, we have two aliases, one is LH, one is P PWD. So if I just start typing LH, it knows it's a shell command. Um, so if I start tabbing, what you're seeing there are the file system. It's, it's made to automatically do path completion for shell commands like that. Um, one other command we had in there, I, I believe, was uh, PWD. Same thing, it's gonna run a bang PWD. Uh, he had showed you a few minutes ago about redirecting to files. Anyone who's familiar with Bash knows that if you type alias in Bash, it'll give you all your aliases in a reusable syntax. It's meant to take that and copy that into like your Bash RC file so they're persistent. We do the same thing. Our alias list is actually, that's the way you would create an alias. So if I took that and just redirected that to my aliases or dot my alias dot text, you could now use that file as your startup script for CMD2 apps. So now you've preserved all of your aliases. A very similar feature to aliases is macros. Um, I think this is closer, when I wrote this, I think it was, it was closer to what C Shell does, where their aliases actually allow you to have argument placeholders in them. And this is kind of useful, especially for testers who run these frequently long commands, and maybe only the second positional argument changes, and you don't want to have to retype that every time. The, the way the syntax works for this is you say macro create, backup is the name, and I'm going to run a copy, and the argument placeholders are numbered. It, the one means take the first argument I pass into the macro when I call it and fill in all the, the brace ones. And then you know, two is the same way. Take the second argument and put it there. If when you call this macro, if you call backup later and you give it four arguments, it just takes those extra arguments and tags it onto the resolve value. Basically what a macro would do, if I ran it and I said backup file.txt four, it's gonna behind the scenes run a shell command with copy um, because I had quotes in the macro definition, it's going to quote that file name, so it'll handle any spaces you had in there, and it's going to copy that file to something called file.txt version 4. That's the way the macro would work. So you get, it's very similar to an alias, but you get the argument placeholders. Um, one difference between this and aliases is because aliases resolve during the parsing stage of the command line, whereas macros resolve um, after you hit enter. So therefore, tab completion for this doesn't work so well as far as figuring out what the whole command line is going to be because you'd have missing arguments. So with macros, if you try to tab complete them, you'll just get you'll get path completion, which may be useful to you depending on the macro. But that those are how macro works. I can show you one one back here. If I do a macro list, uh, we have the backup command. So if I just what files we got in here? If I say basic.py version five, I should now have. I have my basic pi and I have my basic pi dot verify. That's how that macro worked. Okay, so this, this is where I think the most advanced uses and most powerful feature we have is. This was added kind of in the last year. Um, who's familiar with arg parse in here? Arg, okay, so arg parse, what it allows you to do is basically format the way a command line is gonna look. You can tell it all your positional arguments, what types it takes, the help text, any optional or flag arguments. Uh, what we do, and I'm really only going to focus on these first two, the third um, is a, it's a decorator that it's not as useful, but you can look at our doc documentation. But what these decorators do, if you remember Todd was showing you the commands that you, to make a command in CMD2, you call it do underscore foo, that's your command, so you now have a command in foo. If you decorate it with one of these decorators with arg parser, which by the way, with arg parser uses parse args underneath, for those who are familiar, and then with arg parser and unknown args uses parse, ar parse known args. So you'll get this separate list of anything arg parse didn't recognize. 
So the way this works, um, this is a very, very simple example. Again, we didn't want to write something too complex, but this is basically, it can be as complex as your parser. So I have a, I have a command that I, I have called f size. It just stands for file size. What it's going to do is take as one of its positional arguments, that third argument there, file path, and it's going to give you the size of the file. It's going to print it back to you. And we have a few argument, uh, optional arguments. One, a comma, if you wanted a comma to separate the thousands dis digit spaces, and a u if you wanted to change the, the units from either bytes to uh, kilobytes or megabytes. Um, now, what I'm going to show you real quick, I'm not going to run it. I want to go back to one other slide because there's something that goes along with this. It's, this is where the real power comes from. Tab completions. If you are using one of our arc parse decorators right out of the box, you get automatic tab completion of all your flag names, and you get, um, so in arc parse, there is a, when you add an argument, and I'll go back to kind of show you this in a minute, when you add an argument, you can give it something called choices. Choices, what arc parse expects is a list. It's saying, for this argument, I only accept these three values. Maybe it's a number and you want only three, four, and five, right? Um, that's kind of limiting, because uh, it's, it's a useful feature if you have a small amount of arguments, but what if you have choices that are very dynamic and state-based, or you wanted to, it's path completion, you wanted to tab complete through a whole file, uh, file system. What we've done is we've taken the add argument function, monkey patched it, uh, and augmented with new arguments. So we have these other things on top of choices, which like I said, is just a list. We have something called choices function and choices method, what it's expecting here is some sort of callable object in Python. It's a function that's going to pass me a list of some sort of choices at the moment the guy, the moment the user hits tab. The difference between choices function and choices method is since our auto completer, uh, that's the name of the class for the arc parts, is kind of a piece of a CMD2 application. If you tell us it's a choices method, we're going to pass in the instance of that app as its self argument for you. If it's just a function where it's not a class method or anything like that, then we're not going to pass self. That's, that's how you would distinguish between them. Completer function and completer methods, these are what Todd referred to earlier. There's a syntax in Python, CMD module specifically, for how you would write a tab completion function. It takes a few different arguments about where you are on the line, what text you're completing. Uh, you can write your own. Sometimes you might have to, but Todd was mentioning that we have a lot built in. Uh, we have shell command completion already built in as one of these functions. We have path completion already built in. So um, um, before I go back to example, one other thing that our arg parse completer does as you're hitting tab two, it keeps track of state. It knows right where you are on that command line, and it knows what you should be completing. It knows, hey, this is the, this is the third positional. Here's what I'm going to tab complete for you, or you're in the middle of a flag, so I'm going to tab complete this particular value for you. So what you get, just with a little bit of work, is tab completion of literally every item in that command line, every possible data set you want. Um, and I'll show you the hint too. One of those bullets talks about a hint if you have no results. So if I go back to this, if you notice for the add argument C, um, this is an action store true, which means if it's present, it's a Boolean true. So we're not, there's nothing to tab complete there other than the, in the flag name. But for units, what we've done We've added a choices list, like I was telling you before, of megabytes or kilobytes. We tab complete on those as well. And then for the file path, you can see I, I use something called completer method, uh, which was on the other slide. And I'm telling it, use the CMD2 path complete method here. That's what I want to tab complete. So if I run this example, I am with CMD. Right. If I do a help on F size, there's the built-in help. All we had to do is define the help in the arg parse decorator. You don't have to type anything different to get this kind of help just because it's an arg parse command. Our help command hooks into it. However, because it is arg parse, you can actually use the dash H flag too and get all that information. What I was telling you before is right out of the box, you get tab completion of flags. So if I type dash dash, those are the flags I can use or just a single dash. These are all the flags I can use. And I'm going to say, I want a comma. Now, because it's keeping state, if I type dash again, you notice comma's gone. It's telling you, you've already used that flag. It's not available. Had this been an argparse flag that's called the append type, where you can have more of them on, on a line, 
it has logic for that, so it would have still been displaying it, but this isn't one of those kind of flags. Um, and now for unit, I can do a double here. Um, and unit, we know expects an argument, expecting either kilobytes or, mil or uh, megabytes. If I start doing something wrong here and I, I want to start a new flag, arg parse, our, our autocompleter knows you're not done with that flag yet. Before you move on, please give me my expected one argument. And that's based on the in args parameter. If you needed 10, it would say 10. So if I'm going to go back and say kilobytes, and now I'm at the positional argument, no, it knows I'm there. Um, if I type something that's not an actual file, it comes back and says, there's no completion results that I recognize. Maybe you don't know what you're doing, so here's a hint. This is what you're supposed to be completing. So I'm going to just choose uh, basic.py. We hit enter. enter. There's our kilobytes. There's, let me take out the, uh, the units real quick. I can show you the comma argument. Um, so there's the comma that showed up. But what you got here is full tab completion with your command with very little work of every single value in there that you have a data set to tab complete against. Um, and it was short. The code for that was quite short. Now your command is obviously going to be a lot uh, longer than this, more complex. One other command we wrote for this was something called pal, just to, um, it's base and exponent math. If you notice, so in, on line 49 here, we say our choices are a range of negative 5 to 6. What's special about that is negative 5 starts with a dash. Arg parse flags by default start with a dash. We're able to tell, just using some arg parse logic, that you're not completing a flag there. You're actually completing a negative number. So if I type pal and I start tabbing, it wants the base first. Let me open this up a little bit. So it's telling me, okay, what base do you want? I'm going to say five. Oops. Okay, well, there's, I did it wrong. There's the error that you would have gotten. There's all the choices that you have. By the way, uh, that's an arg parse default output. It's saying all the choices that you, you can choose there. You can imagine how ugly the help output would be if you had 900 choices. Um, but so I'm going to, uh, for, uh, for the exponent, I'm just going to choose, I'm going to hit negative. It knows I'm not in a flag because it's a negative number. So now it's, it's pared down those completion results to all my negatives. I'm going to say 5 to the negative 5. There's your answer. Uh, but that's, to me, if we go back to the original slides that were presented this morning uh, or this afternoon, those, the way of doing complete and do commands and those kind of things are very much the way you would do it in CMD, which is a fine API in Python, but it's kind of stripped down. This would be the recommended way I would, I would say do stuff because you get all your help, you get all your tab completion. Arg parse is a very highly regarded, well-known Python standard library thing, so you don't have to learn anything beyond normal Python. Um, Oh, and okay, so going back real quick to the aliases. Um, we don't have any aliases. Let me just create an alias real quick. Actually, set's a good one. Todd was showing you this earlier. If I hit set and tab, this was giving you context of your actual tab completion items. What that is is this, the second to last bullet. It's called a completion item. It's a custom class that we have. Uh, and a very good example that Todd gave is if you were tab completing ID numbers, maybe a task ID or a job ID, Tab completing numbers isn't very informative to the user. If you can show them a table format, just like we were showing in the set command here, say, okay, task ID had this name. And then they're like, okay, I know I'm tab completing the number one, but now I have some context. Lastly, we've augmented arg parse to take a pretty neat feature that when I've Googled this, a lot of people want it. There's an argument in arg parse, parse called in args. It just means the number of arguments. And it's limited to either stat, uh, an integer, like I want five, or sort of some regular expression type ranges. A star would be zero or more, there's a one or more, um, there's an optional which means zero and one. There's no way to do mins and maxes, and there's no way to do five or more. So we've added uh, to the add argument function of arg parse this syntax at the bottom there, which is t basically takes a tuple. Uh, the first example there, it's a one item tuple, it just means accept five or more items, or the second one is set between eight and 12 items. Our autocompleter hooks into this, so it knows how many items you should be tab completing for that thing before moving on. Uh, and it knows, you know, it, it could accept eight, it can accept up, up to 12. Because of the way we've patched arg parse too, you don't have to do anything special. You can use a regular argument parser object in arg parse because we've hooked their underlying methods and that's what you actually end up calling. You, you call our wrappers. Okay. I'm going to give it back to Todd for the Python stuff. 
Okay, so one, uh, one thing we build in is we build in an embedded Python interpreter. I'm not gonna go into much detail about that, um, but it's a full Python shell. Like if you type Python at the command line, you can run that inside of a CMD2 application. Uh, we actually use this for running Python scripts under the hood. It's good for debugging, a uh, lot of features, but I'm not gonna dive into it for time constraints. We also have an opt-in embedded IPython interpreter. If you've never used IPython, go out and find out what it is. It's amazing, don't ever use Python as a shell again. Use IPython, it's way better. Um, we use it um, mostly for debugging. Like even if we don't ship it to customers, it's awesome because you can get full introspection on your application via self if you allow it. And then if something goes wrong and you're like, hey, I shouldn't be able to get into state, what happened? You can find out. Even though you're not in a debugger, you can jump into an IPython session. You can disable it if you do. Yeah, yeah, and it's disabled by default. Um, but there is, a, like in the basic application, we said self.localsinPy is true. That's where we allow that to be in Pi. It's disabled by default for security purposes. Uh, again, extremely powerful. Also, if you're a data analysis geek, you can get command output uh, directly in IPython and then play with it to your heart's consent, content, which is great for experimental uh, analysis. But really, uh, Python scripting. Uh, assuming you're a Python developer, if you have end users of these applications who also know Python, we have built-in Python scripting with the run PyScript command. And you can run arbitrary Python, whatever you have on your system, but in addition, we build in a couple extra things. Namely, we build in app, which, and you can, there's a attribute where you can change what you call this. We call it app by default. Uh, but then it allows you to call CMD2 <coughs> application commands from your application within your Python script, in addition to all of the arbitrary Python. And the utility of this is your end users don't need to learn a separate API. They, what exactly it is they would type on the command line, that's what you pass to app, is command plus args. But within your script, you can get also the full output of that and extra data, where you can then do conditional control flow. You can say, did it succeed? Did it pass? You know, what were my results? You know, the sky's the limit with what you can do there. And you can also pass uh, commands, arguments, just like you normally would to a Python script. Um, so it's, yeah, extremely powerful. I'm gonna delve into a couple examples. Um, I'm not gonna show the full uh, depth of it, but we have one simple example here called PyScript example. And in this, we implement two commands. And again, it's we're just inheriting, we have an, in, in, uh, we have an init. We do a couple of interesting things here. One, you can always tweak the prompt in CMD2. And by default, it's a static prompt, but in this case, we have a set prompt function that we set it with and we delve in and basically say, hey, we wanna find out what the current working directory is and we're gonna set the prompt based on that. And CMD2 has a full system of hooks where you can hook into CMD2 at anywhere in the application lifecycle and say, I wanna do something special at this stage. So here we have a post command hook that says after command runs, go do this. And we're updating, we're finding the current working directory and updating the prompt. Um, and we also have the ability, if you're not allowing full access to your application in Python, we have the ability to selectively allow access to certain things in your Python scripts. Like here, we're adding access to current working directory specifically within Python, but not the whole application. Um, and ultimately, what we have here is we have two commands. A CD command, which changes directory, and a dir command which prints out the contents of a directory. Nothing sexy, but wanted to show you more conditional control flow. Here we have a script that, uh, it's a normal Python script. We're importing something, you know, we're importing sys, we're importing a couple things from CMD2. Then we're looking at what arguments were passed in. We actually, if you call run PyScript, you give it a name and then you pass in arguments, we actually kind of monkey patch temporarily what your sys.argv is, so to, the, to that script running, it looks like it got passed in on the command line. Uh, so if we say, if you pass in an extra argument, we're gonna set our local directory variable to that. If not, we're gonna hard the code the directory to foobar. Then, uh, since we allowed access into a, in, within Python to our current working directory, we're gonna save that, that function, we're gonna save it off into a variable, 
called original dir. We're going to run with our app, we're going to run a cd command to that directory. We're going to store the results, and there's actually a command result class. It's a custom class where it stores the standard out, the standard error, any extra data you give it, which you save in last results. Uh, and it's also truthy, where if you have any error, then it's false. And if you have no error, it's true. So that way you can test for success or failure of the command. So we say, if here's we get our basic conditional control flow. If our CD command succeeded, then we're going to go down this path. Otherwise, we're going to go down this path. And this is basic if else. And if it succeeded, we're going to do a dir in that directory and print out the contents. But we're actually accessing it from the data, not from any standard out. And that data can be whatever you want to put in there. Uh, and then if it failed, we're going to print out an error message. So real, real simple, but real powerful at the same time. So let me, let me go down here. Wait, where am I? So here I am in my example. As I said, we're setting our current working directory. And then I'm going to run in my uh, run pi script. In scripts, I've got a conditional flow directory. And if I give it a foo directory, I don't have a foo directory. So it's going to print out an error message. If I give it a scripts directory, it's going to print out my content of scripts. This is a super simple example, uh, but we didn't want to get too complicated. What you can do can be arbitrary complex since you have full access to Python code as well as your CMD2 application at the same time. Extremely powerful. It's built in. You don't have to do anything uh, magic to use it. Uh, okay, I'm going to turn this back over to Kevin for a little bit. Uh, yeah, let me get I that just, for you. Well, he's setting something up here. This is a feature that was added because you are kind of limited in a CLI as far as anything asynchronous printing to the screen. If you have a background thread that's running that's gathering data and you want to tell the user, the best you can do is print right over their command line and that's ugly and nobody likes that. So I'm going to show you a demo. It's a very obnoxious demo where I'm just using every feature known to man at the same time. Um, but what, what we have are a few methods here. We have one called asynchronous alert. that ba It displays a message. It, it appears above the prompt where they're typing. The typing never gets messed up. And you can, you can print as many as you want. Um, async update prompt will update the prompt with maybe a status item. You change the color. Maybe there's a count you want to put in there. And then set window title, that's a very generic one if you want to put some status up in the title. Um, but this is generally done with, with a background thread. Um, so like I said, this is a very uh, obnoxious example with colors. But what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm printing some alerts. You can see I'm typing while these things are going. It's not printing over my text. I'm going to control C to cancel that real quick. The, the prompt is flashing ugly. Obviously, you wouldn't choose those colors. But so basically what you have here, it gives you the power of almost a GUI or a in curses type application, we have asynchronous feedback to the user without messing up what they're doing. So that you can have an alert come up and say, oh, I have a new machine connect or, or go, go down on the network. Um, but the, yeah, this, to learn more about this particular feature, I had written in our examples something called asynchronous printing. If you just read that Python file from top to bottom, it is written as a tutorial. <laughs> These are the best practices. This is where you should set up your thread and any locking. Uh, and it, it's fairly self-explanatory on how to do it. But if you have any sort of uh, CLI applications that are multi-threaded, it's a very, very useful feature. Like one minute, say. How much time we got? One minute. Oh, one minute. OK, so we have full Unicode support for everything. Command names, command output, arguments, you name it. Um, it's UTF-8 by default. There's a few characters that are treated specially by our parser that are related to quoting and redirection and piping. Um, so this allows you to work with any language. Uh, we're compatible with Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. And uh, the latest versions of CMD2 are compatible with Python 3.5 or newer. And we test uh, reliably on everything every, every uh, time there's a PR. We have great code coverage. We have good documentation for new contributors. Uh, I don't have time to go into it. We have a built-in regression testing framework. It's very powerful uh, if you have testers or QA personnel. And we have the ability to automatically generate the files it uses either from history or from a script. 
Uh, we also have full application lifecycle hooks where you can inject and register callbacks at pretty much any state of you possibly want to. Uh, we have good uh, info on GitHub. We have a nice README, lots of examples. We also have good documentation on read the docs. And uh, this link will, in video will be up online. Uh, last but not least, uh, I work at Amazon AWS. We're always looking for smart, motivated people. And Kevin works. Yeah, yeah. Research Innovation, place in Virginia. I work at the Melbourne location in Florida. Also, always looking for smart people. So, <laughs> C++ and Python. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, we had one more um, thing. If you like CMD2, we are trying to get ourselves added to the Awesome Python list. So we have a PR out there for Awesome Python. If you end up liking CMD2, please go thumbs up us so we can get added to Awesome Python. Hope you enjoyed it.